I'm in the process of rereading a book I read many years ago, uh, a spiritual classic from the Russian Orthodox tradition called The Way of a Pilgrim. And it's a great book. It's, uh, it concerns a man from mid-19th century Russia, young man, who uh, comes across St. Paul's teaching that we should pray unceasingly. And it bothers him. Like, well, what could that possibly mean? And you pray constantly? You pray all the time? Well, it, it, it bugged him, and the botheration finally led him to a monastery and to a spiritual master who said, I'll teach you exactly what Paul means. And he taught him the Jesus prayer. The Jesus prayer, especially as it appears in the way of a pilgrim, is as short as this. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Now, I've heard versions like, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of a living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. But the one in the book is simply, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. So the master said to him, I want you to go back to your room. I want you to pray that prayer a thousand times. And the guy said, a thousand times? Yeah, a thousand times. So he did. And he got through it and <laughs> went back to the teacher and said, okay, I did it. I did it. And the teacher goes, good. Now, I want you to pray it 10,000 times. And that's how the story really commences, is the master was sharing with him this um, prayer from what's called the Hezekiah tradition in the East, practiced by the monks at the high spiritual level. The idea is to place this prayer so deeply within your mind, your heart, and even your body. Because as you pray the first part, Lord Jesus Christ, you're meant to breathe in. Have mercy on me, you're meant to breathe out. So it becomes part of the rhythm of your body, of your breathing. It's to place that so deeply in you that it becomes indeed a form of constant prayer. Now, we post-Freudians are probably talking about unconscious mind, and I think they're driving at something like that, where it becomes so second nature to you that you are constantly breathing in the Lord Jesus Christ and breathing out your, your sin. So he said, that's the secret. That's what Paul meant when he said, pray constantly. Get this prayer in you. So with that, the man uh, commences to wander. And they say that the Russian, we translate it as pilgrim, really has that sense of wanderers, the way of the wanderer. And that's part of Russian spirituality, that the man just sort of wanders from place to place, trusting in the Lord's providence. So he wanders about um, with this prayer on his lips and in his rucksack, in his, in his knapsack, two things, a Bible and the Philokalia, which is this beautiful collection of sayings of the Eastern fathers that he had acquired. He has no money to speak of, no possessions, nothing, just those two things. Well, one fine day, He's accosted by two uh, deserters from the army who knock him out and they steal his two treasures, the two things that he had, the Bible and the Philokalia. He's so distraught that he just weeps openly. You know? Well, some days later, through some fortuitous circumstances, he actually gets his, his treasures back. And here's a scene that stayed in my mind, and I'll suggest it now to all of you. Um, when he got the Bible and the Philokalia back, he... He wept now for joy, and he clung to them like a desperate animal, like he had his, his sustenance back. Well, that image stayed and, and still stays in my mind, because I thought, wow, what, what would I cling to with that kind of tenacity? Or, or turn the question around, the loss of what would prompt in me this desperate sadness. You know? Now, just to make things more pointed, suppose like this, this pilgrim, you don't have any money. You can't replace these things. What loss would so bedevil you that you just weep openly? And, and what thing, if you got it back, would you cling to with such joy? See? Well, what would be your, you know, your TV, your golf clubs, uh, your, your house? What would it be? Again, suppose you're on Desert Island. You're like the Tom Hanks character in Castaway. Like you're, you're just on this Desert Island, and you've lost. Like when he loses the the uh, his friend, you know, the, the the volleyball that he had turned into a kind of an imaginary friend. When he lost that, he wept like a baby, right? Well, as I thought about that, as, as I took that challenge myself, I thought, you know, probably it'd be my iPhone. Like if suddenly my iPhone were gone, it was stolen, or I lost it that would probably fill me with a kind of panic. 
And if I suddenly got it back, I think I would probably cling to it with tremendous tenacity. You know, if suddenly I lost my ability to make phone calls, I lost my GPS, I lost the music, I lost all the things, you know. But here's what's troubling about that, about this bit of confession here. Uh, Ten years ago, I didn't have a cell phone. I got my first cell phone, you know, I'm in my 40s somewhere, I suppose. I got my first cell phone. My whole life without a cell phone. And now I'm at the point where I would like desperately cling to my iPhone. This thing that, that up till I was 40 some years old made no difference to me whatsoever. But see, I would suggest a lot of us are in that position is that we would cling to very evanescent, passing, insubstantial things of the world. How wonderful that this man clings with that kind of animal tenacity to the things that would feed his soul, right? Is he didn't have anything else. He didn't have money or any other possessions. But the things that would feed his soul, the Bible and, and this philokalia, that's what he wanted, you know? Hmm. What would I cling to like a desperate animal? What would you cling to like a desperate animal? It would tell you a lot about your spiritual priorities.